Hello, thanks for joining. We're just getting started. So I'm going to try to get into my little Zoom to see who's joining. Oh, it's great to see a bunch of attendees coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, oh great, it's great to see a lot of people. So we're gonna take a couple seconds here just to see uh, people load up. Uh, hopefully you joined because this is um, our uh, GitOps Days Community Edition. And uh, some of you may have also joined as part of our Weave online user group. So either way, welcome, thanks for coming. Um, so these are, um, if you've been part of our Weave online user group, these have been seasonal events where we've done like in the spring or the winter season, um, like every two weeks, we have a variety of talks that are relevant for um, the GitOps space, the Kubernetes space. Uh, if you joined as part of our GitOps Days community special, um, one of the things we did, if you joined us for GitOps Days in May, uh, we, you know, it was COVID times, we had to shift and understand how the platforms work. So we did a series of community um, specials so we could kind of test out the platforms, have you guys join, give your feedback. Um, and so for those, we, we did a variety of talks. So if you joined for those, it's great to see you back as well. Um, so if you haven't heard, we have GitOps Days EMEA coming up on November 12th and 13th. We're really excited. So um, even if you're not in the EMEA time zone, definitely register at GitOpsDays.com. You um, can you know, get all the links and all that early and, and other things that are relevant, of course, the announcements and such. So uh, make sure you register at GitOpsDays.com. If you are in the EMEA time zone, then perfect. Um, we'll be uh, broadcasting on the 12th and the 13th at approximately um, uh, 10 a.m. to 3 or 4 p.m. Uh, UK, UK time, so that's GMT. Uh, so yeah, if you can join us for that, go to getupstays.com. Um, and so leading up to that, we have today and then two weeks from today um, and then potentially after um, rolling after um, Get Up Stays, um, these community specials, um, especially for those of you who have been using Flux, um, we wanted to use this as an opportunity both to kind of outline the power of GitOps. And um, if you don't know already, um, we are moving quickly into Flux V2 category where we have been um, re-architecting and really strengthening um, what you used to get with Flux um, into this new architecture that's uh, much more powerful, has more features, and uh, is also easier to contribute to. So hopefully if you've heard of um, the GitOps toolkit, it is a kind of a part of um, Flux V2 now. So Flux, the original Flux is kind of decoupled into these two projects so that hopefully it's less of a monolith, it's easier to manage, it's easier to use, and it's easier to contribute to. So we'll go into all that. So just sharing that as part of the background of that. Um, so my name is Tomo. I'm head of the developer experience team at Weaveworks. Um, and we're lucky to have here Lee Capilli, who's on our team. We'll be doing fantastic demos of all this. Um, is also a developer experience team. Um, and if you're wondering why we're from Weaveworks, um, uh, we are the people who created Flux and GitOps Toolkit. Um, and of course, it's part of the CNCF and we um, maintain and manage those communities. So uh, yes, uh, I said, so this is really um, targeted toward uh, people who are Flux users. Um, we are so thankful for your being Flux users and we wanna make sure that you can get these little sneak peeks into what's to come. Um, and if you're new to it, then um, we'll also have some stuff on the power of GitOps um, and sort of to get you started if you're interested in learning about the generals of GitOps. So as we're here right now, I'm kind of curious quickly, um, I don't usually use the raise hand features, but um, if you are currently a Flux user, would you mind uh, sharing in the chat or um, um, raising your hand? Oh, and sorry, yes, Stacy on our team, community manager is running. She also threw this poll. So um, this will help us to kind of gauge. And it, it seems to be getting, <laughs> I don't use these poll features. So this is actually kind of entertaining. So um, good, it looks, seems like it's uh, maybe uh, two thirds of you use Flux. So excellent. So I'm glad you joined. Um, if you haven't heard, we're doing our best to make sure we spread the word that um, we are you know, moving into Flux V2 soon. We're not in migration stage yet, but we would love your feedback on making sure that we create the best migration um, experience possible um, when the time comes. Um, and then for those of you, the third of you who are new to it, welcome. Um, if you're excited about GitOps, um, let's get to it. So. 
just a little bit of background um, where Weave works. Um, you probably know a lot of our open source companies. If you haven't heard of us, um, you could check out weave.works. Um, the key thing that we're going to talk about today, of course, is Flux and the GitOps toolkit, which are in the CNCF. And they're kind of the core of what got us to the place of um, this concept of GitOps, uh, which our CEO coined. Um, the only thing else I'll mention here is we have Weave Flagger that hopefully you've heard about, um, which is um, an add-on in a sense uh, to Flux. It, it brings Canary deployments and progressive delivery um, to that. So um, it's really another next step to think about if uh, you're on your GitOps journey. Uh, and then uh, finally, just some housekeeping. I think now we're in the era where I don't have to explain how to use Zoom, um, but when you have your questions, make sure to use the chat functionality and that's what we'll measure. Um, these usually run about 45 minutes, um, but we'll see, we've got a lot of uh, topics to cover here. So um, if we reach 45 minutes and there's nothing left, then we'll, we'll end there. Um, but if we go over time, then uh, we'll go to 60 minutes, but we'll have a hard cutoff at 60 minutes. So I'm going to take one pause because I see a lot of things in the chat. Um, Stacy, yeah, wave to me if there's any uh, major, major things that uh, are burning at this point. Um, if not, we, um, I will be monitoring your chat. I see some questions. Hey, Pavan, thanks for joining. Um, and we will um, get to those questions um, at certain bookmarks in the presentation. So for the basics, just to make sure we have level ground, um, if you want to find out more, definitely check out our last GitOps Days um, recordings. Um, but one core thing that we talk about is that it's, um, an op it's a methodology um, that is not just for app dev, but also for operations. In fact, it's kind of GitOps for all the things. Um, we had some great talks at GitOps Days that was even about sheet ops, where you could do um, operations using Google Sheets. Uh, why? Because there is versioning and it meets some of the, um, the basic requirements. Um, but most importantly, GitOps is, um, it's not any particular tool or technology. It's really, you know, this approach and a paradigm um, that, uh, that you'll see more and more um, from the speakers we had and the speakers we will have at GitOps Days is really, really helping um, people um, leverage the benefits of, of GitOps. Uh, so with that, also, um, one of the things we covered were the four principles of GitOps. So you may be on your journey and you may not check all four of these boxes, but anywhere you can start um, will get you on your path. So you want to um, be thinking about if your system isn't already described declaratively, that that's, that's a core um, practice that will get you on your path to GitOps. Um, and of course, versioning, right? Um, versioning um, is really important to make sure that you can um, have that uh, state uh, set. And uh, it does say Git here, but we do also talk about how GitOps doesn't have to use Git. Um, you can um, have different ways, as we talked about. You can have sheets. You can have something that um, has the state versioned, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Git. Um, and of course, um, you can approve changes um, that then are automatically applied to the system. So um, if you saw GitOps days, there are many speakers who talked about how they were able to automate so many of their processes, whether it's app development or operations, so that the teams could then spend their energy on innovating and improving their apps and then learning more things, right? As opposed to doing a lot of manual steps. So that's also great for saving money and for saving time. Um, and then the fourth principle is, of course, um, software agents that ensure correctness um, and give alerts right, to the diffs and actions that happen. Um, so these are sort of the four principles that um, uh, Cornelia Davis outlined at the last GitOps days. Uh, again, if you want to see more, there's great stuff in the recordings. Um, a little sneak peek for what's to come. We're going to be talking about sort of GitOps patterns as well, in which, um, you know, like I said, if you're starting on a journey, you know, anywhere is a good place to start if you can meet one of these principles. But more and more as you get two or three of these, then you'll start seeing the real power of GitOps and seeing these patterns. Um, and we'll start kind of eking into that a little bit with Lee's talk. Um, so with that, I think we've structured this. So we're going to kind of focus on uh, the, some of these ways in which you see these patterns and they come together. And uh, I'll be like, well, prove it. And Lee will give four great demos that um, hopefully progressively show some of the possibilities that you might be able to leverage with GitOps. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lee. Let me know if I need to uh, stop sharing.
Looks like you took over. Excellent. So if uh, I got this correctly, the first one, <laughs> you'll sort of be talking about, um, you'll be kind of highlighting kind of automation, reconciliation, and observability, I believe. Yeah. yeah <laughs> we might go a little off script here. We're playing around a little bit, but I think those are some of the shiny things. If those of you yeah. are interested in like, yes, automation, but and let me see how this reconciliation works and all that, uh, show it to me. So. Yeah, uh, I think probably one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, that we have this call specifically in place uh, to be a great resource and a sneak peek uh, for not just new people to the community and people who are learning about GitOps, but also our huge Flux One user base uh, who has done so many things to pioneer this methodology uh, and really move forward what it means to have safe operational practices that give us repeatability and safety in our businesses, uh, as well as just a higher level of confidence in the way that we collaborate with our peers. Uh, and the GitOps toolkit is the something new that the Flux maintenance team uh, has been working on for a few months now. Uh, we really think that this is a terrific and solid start. We have a new architecture uh, that will bring us into a world of flux too, uh, with more confident, quicker, faster, more flexible, modular, extensible operations uh, for our GitOps workflows and the cultures that we build around GitOps. Uh, so if you haven't already checked it out, uh, you can head over to Toolkit, FluxCD.io. This is a fantastic docs site that we've put together for what will be Flux2. Uh, if things are looking a little bit different for you, just a heads up that I usually use dark mode uh, in my browser. So it, everything is a monotonous gray instead of a white. Uh, sorry if that's a little bit confusing, but my eyes prefer that. Uh, so on the GitOps Toolkit website, you'll see the homepage here that describes how we've broken down Flux into many different controllers. There's the source controller, the customized controller, and the Helm controller. And if this is a looking a little bit complicated, allow me to go to my command line and uh, ease your concerns a bit, because I really think that what we have is so much powerful, more powerful and so much simpler to use uh, than Flux One. So you can see here when you go to our guides and then into installation, uh, this will be primarily what we're going through today, and I'll be explaining any of the differences and any of the key ideas that you're going to need to be able to start playing with the GitOps toolkit in your own environments, say pre-production, and also what would Flux V2 will look like. So uh, just a heads up, we're going to be installing the GOTK command line tool in this demo. Uh, but the team does expect that in the coming week and a half or two that we will rename this tool to Flux. So any GOTK commands, uh, we will we'll probably be doing Flux in the future instead. So Flux check, Flux bootstrap, etc. So I've got the GOTK command line tool installed. Uh, I have a development build, but you can get it already from the brew tap as well as by using the installation script. Uh, and this is the GOTK tool and its help output. So you can see here that we've got some installation helpers. This is more of a development style thing where it would just do a coop cuddle apply of the manifests with your options to the cluster. But we will do the bootstrap. This is an exciting upgrade from what we had in Flux One. Uh, I am going to bootstrap my, or actually, sorry, one second. Let's go ahead and create a client cluster first. I will call this, look, we'll just call it Flux. Okay, so I've got a client cluster up and ready to go pretty soon here. And we're going to work on the bootstrap. So I want to bootstrap my existing cluster using my GitHub token from my machine my personal GitHub account. I want to make a, re a repository that I own and it's gonna be a personal private repo. I want the path in that repo that holds all of my config to be the cluster directory. 
the repo is going to be called GitOps Toolkit System. And I will use the main branch, which is the new branch that is typically used for or is used by default for all new GitHub repositories uh, because of the name change. So just a heads up. Yeah, if you haven't made a repo on GitHub recently, it's no longer master. It's the main branch. So I will take this bootstrap command and uh, our control plane should start up here in, I suppose, just a few seconds. And we're using a fresh, shiny new Kubernetes cluster here on the uh, 19.1 patch release. Yeah. Better than using 19.0, of course. <laughs> Looks like our uh, API server is up and running here, which is a good sign. Kind of such a reliable development tool. So I've got a brand new cluster. The very first thing I want to do is go ahead and, oops, bootstrap uh, a new repository. Now, this repository doesn't exist yet. If it did exist, it would bootstrap directly from it already, and it would update any necessary manifests. But the GOTK command line tool, or Flux in the future, will have access to create a repository on my behalf. So you can see here, it connected to GitHub, it made a repo for me and cloned it. Uh, and then it's generating a bunch of manifests. This is a temporary clone. It pushes them to my repository for me. And just instantly, you see a bunch of these objects are being created inside the cluster. There's a new namespace in the cluster. I'm not using kubectl, this is just an installation step. And in this process, we're now waiting for the deployments of the GitOps Toolkit components to finish. So let's go ahead and take a look at that new repository, actually. I'm kind of curious. Could I say hub clone my repo? And it's called GOPK system. This is just a git command, but I use the hub command line tool to get it. Wow. Yes. So let's go ahead and open that. We'll append it to our existing editor. Here's my demo folder. I'll be using some of these files to explain some key concepts. Uh, and then we now have our new repository open as well. Oh boy, WSL. Oh, my editor just failed. This is the kind of thing that only happens in live demos, I suppose. Cool, there we go. Mm. Guess we won't be using VS Code today. Oh, this um, is working now. Cool. While you're doing that, a quick question was, um, where do we get the commands? Where do you get the commands? Yeah, that's a great question. So I might have skipped over this a little too quickly. But if you go to the Toolkit website, and then you go to Guides, Installation, then the commands are available from a brew tap. Uh, it's from our main Flux tap that we distribute Flux TL with. So if you're already a Flux user, you could just brew install GOTK probably. Uh, and then if you don't want to use brew, uh, either by Linux brew or Mac or the, the native Mac OS X brew, uh, then uh, you can also just use this installation script. Uh, or you could go to the releases directory uh, from our toolkit repository. Uh, that would be github.com slash tool, uh, flux CD toolkit. And then um, slash releases. So you could get the binary directly from here for your um, OS and architecture. We do have a Windows build here as well as the Darwin and Linux builds for ARM. Cool. Uh, hopefully that's a uh, helpful there. Oh, that's perfect. Maybe obvious. Um, yeah, everything is working here. So here we have our new GOTK system repo cloned locally. And you can just see that uh, what the toolkit bootstrapped into this repository for me uh, is the contents of the deployment. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here, such as namespaces, network policies, and, et cetera. So it's installed the 
new flux installation. And uh, I'm hooked up to the cluster here. You can see here's our namespace with us. And if I want to say, get all of the things in that namespace, just to see what the installation looks like. There's a couple of deployments for all of our controllers and uh, everything is synchronized to the cluster. So uh, this is looking health healthy and running. And if we looked at our bootstrap command, you can say uh, it waited for the cluster to synchronize everything. Everything became healthy and bootstrap was finished in about four minutes. Cool. Um, you may have noticed that I actually created a private repository. So let's go check that out really quick. Notice I haven't opened GitHub yet, right? But say I were to go to my account and then just expect it that there's re this repository there. It's been created on my behalf. So I no longer when installing Flux necessarily have to jump between the terminal and my Kubernetes cluster and creating keys and that kind of thing. It will create a private repository for me. And um, there's actually an object inside of the Kubernetes cluster called a Git repository uh, that represents the synchronization of this new repo to the cluster. So here in the GOTK system namespace, I have my repo. Uh, this is a Git repository inside of the source toolkit API. And we can see that it's been ready and that it's fetched a specific revision from the main branch at this commit. So this commit is E157240. And I have this repo, the settings, under settings, deploy keys. With that one bootstrap command, new PKI was generated into the cluster and it was configured for me automatically in the GitHub repository. So this to me is such a huge improvement. It's a one step bootstrap, a single command that you could use multiple times on many clusters uh, and you would be good to go to sync your main configuration repo. At this point now, I've never used a kubectl apply command on my cluster at all. And we have a GitOps repository hooked up and synchronizing regularly. So I can drop manifests directly into this repository and they will show up in my cluster. Let's go ahead and do that. That would be the next thing, right? We've got a GitOps repo hooked up and now all of the infrastructure is installed but let's get an application running, right? I'm gonna go ahead and copy, let's get something from pod info. How about, think of that. Yeah, there's a deployment that I can get. I'm just gonna grab this deployment YAML from the demo application repository. And then let's go ahead and put it into our cluster config repo and before we do that, let's make a default namespace folder just to stay organized. Uh, default folder into the config. Oh, cluster, cluster directory. Did I make a default? Oh, I see. cluster default. There we go. That's what I was trying to do. So then we'll copy this deployment YAML uh, into our new folder. We're inside of the Git repository. Let's just make sure we're up to date here. And uh, let's check our status and go ahead and add. So I've added that new deployment to my stage and we will commit it. Let's say deploy a new front end app. Push that up to the Git repository. And then I could, well, let's just check this. 
Let's see. So if I look at the commit that was just pushed, it went from E157, which is what we were previously reconciled to in the Kubernetes cluster, to O9BO. Right. So if I do a K get git repos, this is just kubectl, kubectl get git repositories. Uh, we can see we are actually already reconciled to the new commit. Now there's another uh, key idea here. So the git repository idea in Flux just syncs the source to the cluster and makes it available. But syncing a git repo is kind of a different idea from applying a git repository. And this is one of the most exciting changes to me, I think, that will really help alleviate some major issues. For one, you can see now that this is reconciled. Before, if you wanted to know, you would have to read in the Flux1 logs. And it was a very frustrating debugging process uh, that sometimes you could not get a good answer on. So now you know that the Git repository for the thing that you were trying to reconcile to the cluster, uh, it is synchronized from this branch at this commit, and it's ready to go. So the source is good. But what about applying? I mentioned that this is a different idea, and this is a really good decision. Uh, we have a separate object called a customization, which is able to apply plain manifests or customized directories from sources. So if I were to say, um, describe this customization, well, let's, let's actually just get the YAML output. Well, um, kubectl get YAML the GOTK system customizations, right? And then I'm going to pipe that to a nice formatter. So um, here we have a bunch of managed field stuff. And then we have, this is the spec right here. All of the other stuff is Kubernetes things and status tracking. Uh, but here we see that this customization is hooked up to the Git repository called GOTK system in the same namespace. And it is going to be synchronizing the path for the cluster every 10 minutes. And there's also going to be an automatic pruning occurring when that's applied. So if I say we're to get the customizations, I can see that in this namespace, I have a customization called this. Uh, and it has actually applied to that revision separately for me. And this is suspendable. So I could say uh, GOTK suspend the customization in the GOTK system namespace, which is the default. And it's called GOTK system. So now if I look at that customization, it says it's no longer ready and it's suspended and not reconciling that. So it won't be applying this customization to the cluster. But this suspending of the customization is separate from the Git repository, which is ready and still syncing my sources to the cluster. Uh, but I'm able to pause the ability to apply that to the cluster on a different interval and I can pause it separately from the repository. This is really cool to me. It's so much clearer what is happening. Uh, and you can do multiple of these from a single uh, Flux installation instead of having to install Flux for every single repo path and ref combination that you wanted to have in your cluster. You simply create these Git repository objects and these customizations to control what sources you want to be available and what paths you want to apply to which namespaces and et cetera. Cool. Uh, I'd be happy to take a break for questions here. Yes. Um, so because I'm... we've hit a, a lot of information, but I guess just right before that, um, the magic of GitOps is again, I've never done a kubectl apply to the cluster, uh, but if I get the deploys, I can already be confident because I know what revision was applied that that front end application that I added to the repo is now deployed and ready. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much for um, yeah, re reiterating that. 
I was also thinking maybe we were being too ambitious to get through four demos because we have tons of questions here. And so um, we won't be able to get through all of them, but we will promise, hopefully if you've put in a real email address, we will email you back or we'll find you um, on our Slack channels. Um, if uh, especially kind of the broader level uh, questions, um, you know, we'll try to get to at the end. And if we don't have time, we'll definitely um, make sure that we reach out to you. Um, so for the specific ones, um, I guess, um, again, I'll pick and choose a little bit. So I apologize. We will get back to you and make sure your questions are answered. Um, but there is one, maybe this is uh, yeah, kind of specific about, um, you know, what's the concept for using different customization other than customize? For example, like why not JSON it or CDK8? Yes. Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, we only have a developing answer currently with the GitOps toolkit specifically. Now, our recommendation is that if you are using complex tooling uh, to template manifests, uh, then it's more repeatable uh, and can be a little bit safer and easier to implement. Uh, if you just have a CI job or a developer side tooling before the commit is done, say with the pre-commit hook, uh, to generate your manifests into a directory uh, in the Git repository. And you can ignore this directory in Git by just putting it in vendor or some directory that GitHub would normally ignore. Uh, if you just only want to read the diffs for the things that actually produce those manifests. However, it can be really helpful actually uh, to be working on just the code, say you're using CDKs, right? So you edit your JavaScript, uh, you push that up to Git, and then in a pre-commit hook or through a CI workflow, it up updates your manifests for you. You can actually read those diffs and it's much more observable. Now, nothing would stop uh, a community member or if we decide that it's uh, important enough of a use case, uh, we could build a CDKs controller or a JSONet controller, uh, or a Q controller. There are many use cases. Um, there could even be a use case for building a generic inflate controller. But uh, from what we have seen with the number of bug reports using manifest generation inside of the Flux daemon uh, from Flux v1, uh, it is probably a better pattern to be pre-generating these things ahead of time. Uh, this is also the pattern that is used inside of the new KPT command line tool released by the Google Cloud Containers team. Um, also, there was a great question earlier, um, which is, do I need to have Flux installed in every namespace? And uh, this is not necessary, uh, but we do support this style of installation still. <clears throat> so if you do a GOTK bootstrap, uh, there is an option for you to restrict it to a single namespace. Um, but we will talk next week uh, for sure about the uh, user multi-tenancy model that we are introducing that makes sure that you can do multiple Git repos delegated to, to many teams uh, across the cluster, managing their own customizations and Helm releases uh, without breaking security boundaries and trust. You only need one set of uh, Flux controllers in the cluster to accomplish that. That, that is a really good question. Um, other ones, there's uh, questions about performance and scalability of the controller syncing changes to clusters. And this one goes really well into a next demo uh, if we're good to move on. What do you think, Temo? Um, yes, uh, just quick thing. Archie, great to see you. I see you have a raised hand. If you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat and we'll do our best to address them during this or after this event. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, thanks again for reiterating. Um, hopefully it was clear to you guys if it isn't, you know, what is the power of GitOps and, and what got shown in this demo. We're happy to follow up. Uh, cool, Lee, so our next demo, we're talking about observability, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the coolest things uh, that primarily Stefan worked on, and uh, but we've we've all done some work to instrument the controllers with Prometheus, uh, so everything is so much more observable than it was before, and allows us to do some cool things. Uh, in installing the monitoring stack, I'm going to show off something that's now new and possible with this new architecture. So because the sources are synced based off of this Git repository custom resource. 
Yeah, so for any of you who uh, joined later, uh, this was some of what we were covering that hopefully was uh, clear in the demo, right? So uh, we were sharing about what we believe are kind of the core four principles of GitOps. Uh, and uh, hopefully you got to see some of them in process and a sneak peek for our next upcoming GitOps days, EMEA, which is November 12th to the 13th. Um, as you saw here, right? We're hoping that you'll have these uh, two or three different types of GitOps principles coming in your journey and that that would be part of sort of the GitOps patterns that you have. And I'm glad to see that Lee's back, but I'll yeah. also take this opportunity mm -hmm. to also share. So um, we are very aware <laughs> that, you know, especially those of you who use Flux, um, you know, we've created um, the new version to be decoupled. And I know that there are two names and I've sort of shared that GitOps toolkit, you know, is a new thing. So it could be kind of confusing that like, why are there these different names? Um, but part of that is um, hopefully you've seen some talks. So it's not like a Flux um, SDK. Um, it's not um, something that's specific to Flux because it is a toolkit on which Flux V2 is built, but other things can be built as well. So we'll have future talks on that, on why we had the naming for that. And we understand it can create some confusion. Um, it's not just simply Flux V2, but it's because there are other things that um, the community can do to build upon that. But that's a separate talk. But in case you were confused, because I did see the question, like what's the difference between Flux V2 and, and, and GitOps Toolkit, um, we'll, we'll keep uh, fine tuning that to make it as minimally confusing as possible. Um, so with that, let's uh, get Lee back. Thanks, Demo, for covering for me and all my, <laughs> my internet bounced. It, it, it was, was kind of horrifying. Well, yeah. It's something I wanted to share anyway. I, I know it can be confusing, and it's something we are actively talking about to make sure we have a great community experience. Yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, hopefully I didn't get cut off too much there. But basically, the monitoring stack YAML, uh, we have a Git repo and a customization. I'm going to add these as a child object to our primary config repo that's managing our actual cluster. We can manage multiple clusters from that primary repo, so we call it the fleet repository. And we're going to synchronize a child repo and customization, make that apply to the cluster. I just added that to the GOTK system namespace. Uh, and then I made a edit to the customization YAML to include it in the customize build. And then put those two files into a commit. Um, added a friendly commit message, and then we pushed it. So we went from 09 BOCJ7 to E57. And if we get the Git repos, hopefully we've already, yeah, we've already updated to this. If I didn't need to, or if I wasn't updated to this, then what we could do is reconcile the source for that Git repository. And that would be the equivalent of a flux CTL sync there. Uh, similarly, you could suspend and resume on that same resource, uh, which I think I showed earlier. So uh, that should be applied. Um, and if I go ahead and check out the customization, uh, we can, oh, I suspended it earlier. Yeah, okay, let's go ahead and resume that. It's gonna be GOTK. Resume customization, GOTK system. There we are. So that'll apply. Now, this customization has something that we haven't showed yet, and it's cool. Uh, there is a series of health checks in it. And we won't have time to talk about this, but one of the big problems that people run into reconciling uh, their applications is that things are sometimes dependent on one another, or they can cause undesirable deployment errors uh, that can make things look really messy and hard to debug if you're applying things all at the same time, even if they would eventually converge. And so what you can do is if you have critical infrastructure, say, such as like a CNI, you know, or a logging or monitoring stack or databases that should be up and provisioned and uh, seeded with data or a schema before an application starts and serves to users, 
then you can create health checks uh, that will not signal this customization as ready until these health checks pass within the acceptable timeout that you specify. But if these health checks do pass, this will be marked as ready and other customizations and even things like helm releases uh, can depend on this one. So you can block the reconciliation of another uh, set of resources based on health checks and also get some nice reporting. Uh, here we see that the revision was applied and uh, we can just go ahead and check that. Uh, we see it's now uh, ready, true. And if I look at the deploys in the GOTK system namespace, we now have a Prometheus as well as a Grafana running. Uh, so let's go ahead and port forward. And you can get this, all of these instructions. I'm, I'm not inventing anything uh, here. It is all available uh, inside of the guide. Just make sure. And that is down in this monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana uh, section of the installation guide. Uh, you are able to just install these Grafana dashboards and not install a Grafana. Uh, and also manage your own Prometheus if you would like, obviously. But uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but that, that is something that you can do. So I am going to, well, let's just port forward to 3000 here. And then I will open up the Grafana dashboard, which should be running inside of my new Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this monitoring stack was provisioned purely with GitOps through a child Git repository. And uh, notable that that child Git repository is public, but I could have forked it as well. And I will go to this top link here. If you don't know how to navigate Grafana, it's a little confusing. You just click this title for the dashboard that you want. And I can go to GitOps Toolkit Control Plane. This will show me that all of the, the number of controllers that are running and registered with the the control plane, as well as how long the requests are taking to the Kubernetes API from all of those controllers on average, uh, both their P9, P50 and P99 latency. Uh, if you're a metrics nerd, uh, you probably understand the power of this. Uh, but this gives you the ability to do alerting, you know, and then like fire things off in Alert Manager uh, if somebody needs to be paged because Git repositories are not reconciling. Uh, or the Kubernetes API in context of reconciling Git stuff or um, applying manifests, you know, via customizations is getting super slow. Uh, you can see how many requests a second the entire system is using. And so somebody asked a great question about what the performance and the overhead is of uh, multiple controllers talking to the cluster. And you can see here that um, this whole system is operating within very efficient means. Um, maybe this wouldn't be acceptable for an edge workload and we could talk about bundling the controllers into a single controller manager, uh, but we're only using 62 megs of memory uh, for the benefits that this gives you uh, with the ability to reconcile so many repos to the cluster at the same time. Um, if we look at the stats, this is a cool little dashboard as well. Uh, we can see the different objects that are applied and their individual readiness status. Uh, so all of these things are exported as series in Prometheus, uh, and you can build wonderful dashboards around them. You could picture yourself uh, building a deployment dashboard with HTTP health codes and things that also contains when the last time uh, the uh, specific you know, uh, application that you're concerned about was deployed. And uh, these are very open interfaces, which I believe is a hugely differentiating thing for what we're building here. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the, uh, oh, this wasn't planned, but it just in the area of user interfaces, I'd also like to point out a huge benefit of using custom resources and Kubernetes native statuses uh, to display all, or to share all of this information with the system is you also end up getting some pretty good user interface uh, benefits, right? So kubectl, you know, it's great. There are also much cooler command line tools like k9s, which give you an interactive like n curses style, you know, text-based UI. But uh, the Octant project uh, works really great, you know? And if we switch over to 
uh, uh, sorry, one second. I got to copy my kube config because I'm on Windows. Kube config. We'll overwrite that because it's a new cluster, right? We'll start up Octant again. I was hooked up to an older cluster there. But here we see we're hooked up to the flux kind cluster that I just created. And if I go to custom resources, in addition to seeing all of my workloads, uh, I can monitor the apply state of, uh, uh, sometimes this uh, thing takes a little bit of a while to load. I wonder if it's working. Yeah, here. On this older cluster, uh, it just takes a few minutes for Octant to index all of the CRDs and build out the user interfaces. Uh, so you can see in this older cluster that uh, there are a bunch of different custom resources and detailed status messages available, you know, at times, and you could go and edit these things uh, inside of the user interface. So um, because we've picked such open interfaces, we can use open tools uh, to change the specification of this Git repository, or this, yeah, this Git repository. And, or, sorry, this is a Helm chart. Uh, similarly, Lens works really well as well. So if I were to um, add a, do I need to reload this one as well? Uh, it's probably not going to be fast enough. Anyway, Lens is cool. But uh, yeah, user interfaces, usability. Uh, the last thing that we can talk about is just Helm. And uh, we can do this rather quickly. So I'll take these uh, two charts, um, Helm releases, and I'll drag them into the default namespace here. And then let's go commit those. Uh, we'll say release uh, Helm apps, um, Helm repos, and Git. Uh, this is supposed to be the GOTK system. You can tell I'm a developer because of all of the uh, mistakes that I make using the git command line tool. Right. So um, what I'm doing here, and um, we won't have too much time to get into this, but basically I'm making a namespace that I want to deploy a Helm release to. So this Helm release inside of the default namespace will deploy to the pod info Helm namespace. Uh, this is named pod info helm because it's getting the pod info chart with this semver range from a helm repository which is defined up here this helm repository is synced every minute and the helm release is ensured that it's synced to the cluster in the proper way so it doesn't install it every five minutes but it makes sure that it's installed with the right parameters and values every five minutes uh, and we have some extra values right so instead of just having one replica we're deploying two and um, the alternative is this is how you go from a Helm repository. The reason we've split this out into another object in Flux v1, this used to be embedded inside of the Helm release, is because you get this kind of composability. So instead of using a Helm release, we can insert a Git repository into the source ref. Uh, we can deploy a path instead of a chart name from the Git repository. This uh, is not something that makes sense with the Git repo, uh, deploying a semver range, because whenever we update the Git repo, it'll just get deployed. So that option is just ignored. Um, and you can see we're doing the same thing, making a new target namespace uh, for pod info to be deployed into. Uh, since we're deploying the same app, it made two different namespaces so that they don't step on each other. And um, this is a cool feature as well. It's the Git repo. You can specify an ignore file so that you only sync a one directory. 
So we're just getting the charts directory here and ignoring everything else. Um, and we're getting the master branch from this Git repository and uh, deploying a path as a Helm release. So assuming that our reconciliation uh, has gone rather quickly, I can use kubectl get. I'm just basically treating myself as like read-only access to the cluster. I can see that these Helm releases have been synced to the cluster. Uh, and uh, if I get all, you know, in all namespaces, I guess, then you could see that there is uh, two deployments, one in the pod info git namespace and one in the pod info helm namespace. And it's possible to still use the helm command line tool uh, to list those helm releases in the cluster if you'd like to index your applications. So that was uh, the last demo that we we're trying to go through. I went through it rather quickly, so I'm sorry if uh, you've got huge questions on this integration. We do have a little bit more time left, I think, in the time block. Is that true, Timo? Yes, uh, if we go to the hard stop, we've got uh, about seven minutes left. Um, but yeah, so I saw that you, you kind of went from our third to the fourth demo as well. So just to like kind of reinforce the GitOps concept. So a lot of those, as we talked about the patterns, right? So we demonstrated version controlling, automation, reconciliation, observability. Um, hopefully the, the more that you can um, pack all these things together, uh, the more you're getting the deeper level GitOps uh, benefits. So maybe we can kind of just reinforce. So maybe from, yeah, a team perspective or even a business perspective, like what would be the, the things that you would highlight if you're um, you know, trying to convince your team or your management why GitOps is important to, to bring in? Not not the yeah. ten minute version, but like uh -huh. you know, the one minute version. No, this is this is such a great question, and um, I thought about the quickest way to answer this. Um, so I love I love doing technology demos. That's awesome, right? But technology is only important when you have it when you talk about it in the context of the people that use it. You know, the people who get value. And um, what you can see here is that we have split up the ideas of sources and of applying. This gives your development team or your DevOps person or, or even a platform person the freedom to control how they apply their resources separately from what sources are synced to the cluster. So if managing Git is more of an administrator role that's managed by you know, somebody who does check-ins with security, say you're in a really high compliance environment, uh, that's that separation is now possible because of the way that GitOps Toolkit has been built. This lets Flux2 be really powerful. Um, if you are a platform person or an operations person, the Prometheus instrumentation, uh, this is amazing, right? You can see granularly uh, how long it took to acquire sources over time, right? You, you can understand deeply what the system is doing and see that all of your things are ready from a central dashboard without even accessing the cluster. It's just through metrics, right? You can monitor the performance of the control plane, right? And make sure that it's not hammering your Kubernetes, um, you know, API server, right? So you can see that there's been an effect on the request duration uh, as the controllers had more to do, right? And with its limited resources, but that memory usage is about the same. You know, and ultimately the value of GitOps itself, right? So all of these things are complementary. but if you're thinking about adopting this huge cultural shift, you know, the benefits that you're looking to get from moving your, really your intellectual property of how you run your business, how you create your infrastructure, how you serve your customers or fulfill your you know, emergency needs to society's infrastructure or whatever role your organization, business, company, uh, nonprofit serves, you know, to the greater community. Uh, GitOps gives you a repeatable, versioned, collaboration-friendly, and accurate artifact of exactly what you want to specify about how to run your workload so that your cluster is no longer the bus factor in whether or not you can operate your business today and tomorrow, right? 
you can look back three years ago, say you were doing GitOps three years ago, and you could replicate the state of your business. And you could see how it could change. And because you use commits and you know common workflows like pull requests and things like that, you can see who author changes, uh, who had some iffy ideas about like, um, oh, I, I wanted to ask a question about this particular change. Like, why are we, you know, um, adding this pre-exec hook here? You know, or why why are we adding pre-stop hooks and then changing the, um, you know, reconciliation loop for our service mesh and that kind of thing. Uh, these types of questions can now be answered by looking back into the Git histories uh, that ultimately are the true source of how we want our infrastructure to be configured. Um, so in that culture shift, if you're looking for those benefits, uh, then you can see that the technical architecture of what we are doing with Flux2 is purpose-built for the community. Uh, that we, we understand the problems that have gone, uh, that have plagued Flux1 for years, right? And it's clear that Flux1 has produced so much value for people. People are going to continue using it probably for too long. Right. But as much as we can, we would love to help the community move forward to these better patterns uh, and continue getting feedback in the places where we're making missteps uh, so that we can build the best GitOps tooling available. Oh, that actually goes to one of the earliest questions that uh, we had uh, when you started your bootstrapping demos, like, is this supposed to be done by a cluster admin? Um, so yes, but also many other roles, right? And it goes back to sort of mm -hmm. GitOpsing all the things. It's not just an app dev tool, it's not just for operators, but. Yes, um, and I have been that that platform operator before on, you know, in a medium-sized company working with many teams. And uh, I, I hear the hidden concern uh, of like, Hey, if I'm a if I'm on a development team and I don't have administrative access to my cluster, can I still use my own small set of privileges to sync sources and apply manifests? And the answer is wholeheartedly yes. We want to enable that use case, and there is work happening right now with our multi-tenancy model uh, that is very exciting. We'll talk about it probably in November. Excellent. So with that, um, we see many more questions. Uh, like we said, hopefully you didn't put a fake email in your email address. Uh, we will personally, we promise that we will be emailing you. Um, let me quickly share the closing slides because we have lots of links that, again, also you'll get in the email um, the links for um, the next steps and for um, a lot of the questions that you have. Sorry, can you see my slides? Okay, here we go. A little bit of coordination here. So um, just to mention, so this was part one, we're doing this as a series and next one is part two and is uh, exactly two weeks from now. Um, so we showed a sneak peek, but we're over time now. So make sure to follow us on the GitOps community um, meetup group. That's the best place to get the latest greatest on the schedule. And as we mentioned, uh, GitOps Days EMEA is November 12th to the 13th. Um, it's still good to register at the site so you can get all the resources early. Um, and then these um, links, especially I would say um, we have this gitops.community link where Stacy here is our community manager and has put some of these basics here. Um, uh, if you want specific things to Flux2 uh, and the GitOps toolkit, um, definitely go to the GitOps GitHub page that hopefully you know, and under toolkit discussions is the best place to start um, asking questions or making suggestions. Um, and again, all this will be in your um, uh, email that follows up with this. So thank you so much everybody for joining and your tons of questions, um, really appreciate it. And uh, of course, this is all part of making sure that we set up the best migration experience for you that's to come. So the more feedback we get from you, the better we can um, prepare. So we really appreciate it. Um, so thank you again to Lee for the talk and we'll see you in two weeks. And thanks again to Stacy, our community manager who set this up. So we will see you again. Thank you. Bye everybody.